Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. Cuttlefish have passed a test designed for small human children. Polaroid has made a pen that draws in edible 3D candy. What we can learn from cats about being happier and more content with life and a website that translates your typing into jazz music. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. You know the marshmallow test? Not the YouTube thing where you shove as many marshmallows as possible in your cheeks and try to say chubby bunny, but the 1972 Stanford University experiment in which preschoolers were left alone in a room with a marshmallow and told that if they could wait for 15 minutes without eating the marshmallow, they'd be given a second one and could eat both of them. It was an experiment on the development of humans' cognitive abilities, specifically the idea of delayed gratification, as well as what a child's response could indicate about their future success, which the researchers found there was a strong correlation between kids who put off eating the first marshmallow and indicators like good grades and strong self-confidence as they grew older. The study's been criticized for a number of reasons over the years, including for the fact that kids who ate the first marshmallow may have been more used to food scarcity, and as such may also have faced other challenges that led to them having worse grades or falling short of other types of success indicators. And this is something lead author Walter Mischel himself was aware of, and he cautioned people not to overly rely on the findings of his study. Subsequent studies over the years have also been done to acknowledge other factors in children's lives, with a 2020 study from Germany finding that kids were able to delay gratification longer when they depended on each other. But in addition to these reboots of the classic marshmallow experiment on other groups of children, it's also been adapted for different species of animals. Now, of course, you can't just explain the whole second marshmallow thing to an animal, but scientists can train them to understand that better food is coming if they wait. And a number of studies have been done on dogs, primates, and corvids, or crows, to show that they do indeed have a sense of self-control in delayed gratification. And now, cuttlefish have joined the ranks of us creatures in the animal kingdom who can successfully delay gratification. Technically, cuttlefish have passed a version of the marshmallow test before. In studies, they've shown an ability to learn and remember details about past forages to inform future ones. But behavioral ecologist Alexandra Schnell of the University of Cambridge wanted to determine if that was indicative of self-control. In a paper published this week in the journal Proceedings of the Royal Society, Schnell and her team first determined which types of food the cuttlefish in the study liked versus the others. It turned out that they were really into live grass shrimp and not so much into king prawn. The cuttlefish were then put into tanks with enclosed transparent chambers inside of them which housed the shrimp and the prawn separately. Quoting Science Alert, The doors also had symbols on them that the cuttlefish had been trained to recognize. A circle meant the door would open straight away. A triangle meant the door would open after a time interval between 10 and 130 seconds, and a square used only in the control condition meant the door stayed closed indefinitely. In the test condition, the prawn was placed behind the open door while the live shrimp was only accessible after a delay. If the cuttlefish went for the prawn, the shrimp was immediately removed. Meanwhile, in the control group, the shrimp remained inaccessible behind the square symbol door that wouldn't open. The researchers found that all of the cuttlefish in the test condition decided to wait for their preferred food, the live shrimp, but didn't bother to do so in the control group where they couldn't access it. Cuttlefish in the present study were all able to wait for the better reward and tolerated delays for up to 50 to 130 seconds, which is comparable to what we see in large-brained vertebrates such as chimpanzees, crows, and parrots, Schnell said. End quote. So from this study, it seems pretty evident that cuttlefish, unlike rodents and pigeons and chickens, are indeed able to exert self-control to delay gratification. But the question now is why? Quoting Ars Technica, Humans may have evolved the ability to delay gratification as a means of strengthening social bonds, thereby benefiting the species as a whole. In apes, corvids, and parrots, the evolutionary driver might be linked to their use of tools and storage of food or caching behavior, as well as strengthening social bonds. But cuttlefish do not use tools or store food, and they're not a social species. 
Rather, cuttlefish seem to have developed this link between self-control and cognitive performance via a completely different evolutionary pathway, an example of convergent evolution. Cuttlefish spend most of their time camouflaging, sitting and waiting, punctuated by brief periods of foraging, said Schnell of her working hypothesis for how the cephalopods may have developed this ability to exert self-control. They break camouflage when they forage, so they're exposed to every predator in the ocean that wants to eat them. We speculate that delayed gratification may have evolved as a byproduct of this, so the cuttlefish can optimize foraging by waiting to choose better quality food. End quote. Which makes sense enough to me, and even though there are some species that can't pass the marshmallow test, I do think there are probably far more than we realize, we just haven't tested them yet. Polaroid has released a new pen that enables you to literally draw pieces of candy. Building off existing 3D printing pen technology in which you can draw out small sculptures with a bulky pen filled with melted plastic, this new device, the Polaroid Candy Play 3D Pen, is filled with candy cartridges that melt as they extrude from the pen and then harden into edible candy. Gizmodo points out that this is similar to two existing products. One is a simple toy pen from Bic that's filled with chocolate instead of ink, so you can draw out little doodles in liquid chocolate, which then harden. It's not unlike making delicate candies with a pastry bag. The other product is the Three Doodler, a pen like I described up top that allows you to freehand 3D sculptures by shooting out plastic filament instead of ink. There's a number of pens like this on the market now, including one from Polaroid. And Polaroid's Candy Play 3D Pen is almost identical to the 3D Doodler and their own normal 3D Play Pen, but with the brilliant addition of candy. So they all function kind of like a hot glue gun in practice. You plug them in and wait for the cartridge to heat up before you can use it to draw with, and then you wait for your creation to dry and harden, and in the case of the Candy Play 3D Pen, consume. As I've covered previously, there's a big market right now for 3D bioprinting, but those are massive undertakings requiring specialized printers, software, and sophisticated knowledge of how to craft 3D printable designs. The Candy Play 3D Pen, like the 3 Doodler, literally just requires you to know how to hold a pen and press a few buttons. It's not even really 3D printing as we've come to know it, it's just extruding material from a pen. That you can choose to construct into a complex 3D shape if you'd like. But also, it's candy. For 50 bucks, the Candy Play 3D pen comes with six strawberry cartridges, but they also offer refills in orange, apple, grape, lemon, and cola, all of which basically look like a Jolly Rancher and are sugar-free. The promotional photos show a candy rose and a gingerbread-like house made out of several different candy types. Honestly, this seems like a slam-dunk Christmas season toy, so I'm a little surprised it's coming out right now. And apparently, it's exclusively available right now only at a UK store called Menkind. But hopefully, it'll be available in other countries soon, because I cannot emphasize enough how badly I want one of these. Well, continuing on the trend of animals being smarter than we often give them credit for, there's a new book out from British philosopher John Gray that suggests we humans actually think too much, and really, if we want to be happier, we should be more like cats. His book, Feline Philosophy, Cats and the Meaning of Life, is not any kind of hard data. It's more a lighthearted meditation on what we can learn from our cats. Sean Illing interviewed Gray for Vox this week, and I just want to pull out a few choice quotes on this feline philosophy. So when asked why humans philosophize, Gray said, quote, I think it's a search for quietude, for a state of calm. And if that's the case, then you have to ask why humans have such a need for calm. Humans are rather anxious and restless by nature. That's what makes us so different from cats. Unless cats are hungry or mating or directly threatened, they default to a condition of rest or contentment or tranquility. Basically, the opposite of humans. So if cats could philosophize, my guess is they'd do it for their own amusement, not because of some deep need for peace. 
Philosophy is such a human thing because it comes from this anxious search for answers, for freedom from anxiety, and really freedom from our own nature. But of course, that's not achievable. If you yearn for tranquility, you'll spend your life in turmoil because that's not what life is like. End quote. Interviewer Illing points out that cats seem impervious to boredom, unlike humans and also perhaps dogs, who seem to constantly need external stimulation. And Gray says, quote, When humans aren't in immediate pain or experiencing immediate pleasure, we're bored. If not immediately, then soon. And all of our pleasures, sex, drinking, good food, whatever, all become boring after a while. Why is that? When cats are not immediately under some direct threat, they revert to being content. The sensation of life itself is enough for them, end quote. Now, I would point out that cats sure seem to put on a lot of choreographed productions at Jellicle Balls, which seem pretty showy and stimulating to me, but I'm not the feline philosopher here, so maybe I've misinterpreted. Anyways, Gray continues, I think it comes from the shock of self-consciousness and the revelation of mortality. If you don't have an image of yourself, as I'm fairly sure cats don't, then you won't think of yourself as a mortal, finite being. You may at some point sense something like death, but it's not a problem for you. When death happens for cats, they seem quite ready for it. They certainly don't waste their lives worrying about death. And I think there's something uniquely human about anxiety over death and constantly thinking of ourselves as mortal. This is where our incessant need for storytelling comes from. If you sit around considering your own mortality, you'll be driven to invent stories about an afterlife so that the stories you fashion for yourself can carry on after death. This is what religions have done, and it's what so-called transhumanists do today. They imagine all these technological solutions to death, and they hope that our minds will persist after our bodies fade away. Cats have no need for these games. They don't have this problem because they don't have the concept of death. They die, of course, but they don't fret over the idea of death. This need to divert ourselves is deeply human. End quote. Now, Gray does admit that all of the great things we humans create out of some of these neuroses and the general joy of being human outweighs the cost. He doesn't, like, wish he was a cat or anything, but he says we should look to all other animals and see what we can learn from them. We should take time to reconnect with nature, to slow down, to just live life without overthinking it all the time. Which, coming from a philosopher, feels a bit like Picasso's unlearning of art, the more you learn about it kind of thing. You know, the more you learn about thinking about thinking, the more you realize you should think less about thinking. But I guess when you find yourself bored or consumed with doom about your own mortality and the questions of the universe, just chill out and try to be content and put the ineffable out of your mind. So at the Golden Globes over the weekend, Pixar's Soul won for Best Animated Motion Picture, and director Pete Docter said something in his acceptance speech that I really liked. Basically, that the life lessons that one can take from jazz music are especially resonant this year, or this past year. How you can't always control what happens, but like a good jazz musician, you can try to turn it into something beautiful. Well, going along with that, I stumbled on this cool little site this week that appears to have maybe been started up last summer by music and sound design company Plan 8, and it's called Jazz Keys, and it's exactly what it says on the tin. So go to jazzkeys.plan8.co, link in the show notes, and you'll be met with a blank page inviting you to type your jazz here. Type in whatever you like, and each key will play a different note. Pressing shift before a key will change the note. Periods and commas are chords. Even the backspace key has an associated sound for when you mess up. Going along with what the soul director said, even deleting and redoing can be a beautiful act. At least that's how backspace periods and commas function if you're in the freeform mode on the site. If you navigate over to the barely visible sidebar and hit the eighth note button with the plus sign, you can switch between different music styles based on various compositions. So in addition to freeform, there's My Romance, Blue and Green, and Peace and Peace. Each changes up the vibe and functionality just a little bit. 
Now, technically, each key doesn't correspond to exactly a certain note. If you play the S key over and over again, for example, it will sound slightly different each time, but that just makes the experience a lot better, because just about anything you type will sound nice instead of completely discordant. And if you think what you typed sounds especially good, you can listen back and even share the sound of what you typed with others. And sharing is kind of cool because when people open the link, they have to wait for the message to play letter by letter, note by note. So it could be a fun way to share messages back and forth with someone. I've seen some people suggesting typing in the text of various classic books to see how they sound, or just spending the day typing your emails in this app just to have a pleasant sounding accompaniment. It's definitely a fun little distraction. Check it out at the link in the show notes. So Jason beat me to a story today about letter locking that, upon reflection, is way better for a visual medium anyways. Basically, researchers at MIT have developed an x-ray-based technique to read 17th century letter-locked messages without damaging them. Letter locking was when you would seal the letter using the parchment itself, not an extra envelope, but on top of that, you'd use a sophisticated method of folding, slicing, and sometimes waxing or tying to ensure that no one could peek at what you've written before it was delivered to its intended recipient. Jason shared both the new x-ray method that's been developed as well as a couple of videos showing how letters used to be locked. It's really cool stuff, so you can go check it out on kotke.org. And also, you may have heard of this before, but it was new to me today. There is a thing called the Dance Your PhD Contest, run by Science Magazine and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's literally a contest for PhD candidates in scientific fields to make videos using dance to explain their research. The 13th annual prize winner was a Finnish grad student whose research and music video are about the physics of atmospheric molecular clusters. You can watch the video as well as videos of the runners-up and previous winners at the link in the show notes. But that is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.